Uh, my name is Brian Knight. My email address is on the screen now. It's bknight at pragmaticworks.com. And today's session is all about creating actionable business intelligence. Uh, this session is being recorded by Liz and will be posted later today. And this session is a piece of uh, the class that we offer called uh, Power BI class. Uh, it's, it's a virtual class. It's also a workshop that we do around the country as well. So okay, if, this, if this stuff interests you, if the day's over, then you may want to consider taking that class. Now, today's session is all about creating actionable BI, which in this case is going to... Uh, Liz, can you hear me okay? Looks like I'm transmitting okay now. Um, yep, I can hear you fine saying, now. You can't hear us. Uh, so the, the session is all about... Okay, gotcha. It's creating about actionable BI, which in our case means we, we're oftentimes focused on just creating analytics for analytics sake. Well, this is about creating analytics that your users can actually make some kind of actionable item on. So let's begin with that, uh, and Power Query is one of those perfect answers for that. Uh, my Twitter handle is at, is at Brian Knight. I will go ahead and uh, open up that real quick. So if you have any questions, you can ask, ask them in my Twitter uh, uh, handle, or you can also ask them in the question panel now. I'll be at taking questions throughout the, throughout the session. I'll be kind of keeping out half an eye on, on Twitter as well as on my session here. My email address is also bnight at Pragmatic Works. I'm a SQL Server MVP at, out of Jacksonville, Florida, and the founder of Pragmatic Works. I've authored a number of SQL Server books, uh, SQL Server books, some of which have been published. And I, uh, I blog at a website called BIDN.com. So uh, today's session, you can actually participate at home as well. Uh, everything I'm going to show is stuff that already exists inside of Excel 2010 or 2013. So if you have a 2013 or 2010, you can download these, uh, these plugins at either uh, PowerPoint.com or you can go to the tiny URL you see on the screen right now. And uh, that is will kind of link you over to how to download these plugins. Uh, or you can just Google or Bing uh, Power Query download, you'll find it there as well. So how this how this fits together? What what is what is power? How does Power Query fit in the whole whole map here? Well, as you can see, Power Query is one of the first tools that is in the new Power BI stack. The Power BI stack, of course, is is Microsoft's uh, answer to self service analytics, and Power Query is an option that your end users will have instead of using things like SIS. As you know, SIS is definitely not going to be a tool for your end users. It's Visual Studio. It's very intimidating to, to some end users. This is going to be a tool for those power users, those power, power BI users that, are, that want to extract data out, they want to transform it somehow, and they may want to uh, load it somewhere else. So especially with dirty data, there's some things that Power Query can do that even SSIS cannot do. Now, uh, and there's, there's some ways you can actually interface SSIS with Power Query. So Power Query's job is to extract the data out and load it into places like Power Pivot. After it's in Power Pivot, we can do things like view it inside a Power Map or our Power View. We can also look at it online with our mobile BI sites as well. So lots of good stuff we can do around that. Now, today's session is going to focus on discovering the data, how we combine it with other data sources, and then refine it and transform it. So when we import data, we can import it from any number of data sources, uh, whether it be flat files or a, a relational data source. Uh, we can also bring it from places like uh, Active Directory if you're a DBA out there. I'm sure we have uh, several hundred people out there right now, and probably a fair amount of those people are DBAs. So if you want to find out what permissions people have, this is a great way of doing it. Uh, you can get data from, from uh, things like Facebook or your inbox like Exchange. They also have data sources like SAP, XML, and soon you're going to see data sources like Salesforce.com and QuickBooks, which they, they showed demos of that in the last uh, uh, conference they had, the World Partner Conference. So really neat stuff you can get data from. After we have that data, we can refresh it on a periodic basis also. That refreshing can be, can be done uh, statically through, through going through and, and uh, uh, hitting the refresh button inside of Excel. It can also be done uh, through, through some API calls, or it can be done automatically through the Power BI websites. Now, Power BI is going to be, uh, Power BI websites are available through Microsoft, through the cloud offering, and it's, it, it is a whole big offering outside of just, just Power Query. All right. Now, once we have the data, we're going to want to transform it somehow. We're going to want to fix it somehow. So Power Query has a whole slew of, of transforms that are available to you some of which are things like you're capitalizing each first letter in each word, and maybe you want to uh, clean out all the unprintable values or remove duplicates. Uh, you may want to pivot the data or unpivot the data. There's lots of good stuff you can do inside this. All the common things you do inside of SIS can be done inside of, of Power Query the transforms, except much simpler. 
All right, one of the neat things you can do also is if I'm bringing data from, like I say, SQL Server over, and it recognizes there's a foreign key, and I'm looking at an employee ID you know, for, for a transaction, we can actually navigate through and merge those tables together by hitting the icon you're seeing with the arrow pointing to it right now. That will actually uh, join the tables together and show you one view on that data. Lastly, there's a load of uh, a whole new formula language called M, M like Microsoft. And this language is going to allow you to have a lot tighter control. It's a workflow-based engine, uh, engine language. And with that, you can do a lot of advanced things. So you're probably an, an M developer if you think you want parameterization or you want to deal with uh, like, uh, uh, tra trapping errors a certain way or manipulating dates. There's going to be a whole, different, a whole slew of reasons that you might use that, co that coding language. But M is a very, very nice, robust language. It looks very unusual at first. It's not, like, it's not like any language I've seen before, but uh, it, it is definitely a language that will be used in this session to kind of get you going here. So I'm actually going to open up a, a, quick, uh, a quick slide real quick, or a quick uh, uh, example real quick, just to kind of get us going. Uh, there we go. All right. Okay. So enough slides. That'll be our, my last slide for the day. And now I'm going to focus on how we actually use this to create an actual intelligence. So my goal in this session is I want to open up a donut shop. And I want to open up a donut shop somewhere in my town of Orange Park, Florida. So what I want to do is I want to first of all find out where I'm going to build this store at and where my competitors are at. And I want to, I want to draw some maps on it and show ultimately where the best place to locate is going to be. So that's our goal in this demo. And after we do that, we'll do some more adventurous things, uh, some more fun examples also. So let me open up a quick web page, and here we go. Let me just kind of go over here, and let's look at Yelp real quick. All right. All right, so we're looking at Orange Park, Florida here, which is where I live. And I want to look at, uh, how about we look at um, uh, donut stores. Okay. Okay. All right, so for donut stores in the Orange Park area, this is what we're seeing. We're seeing some areas uh, around, around the Orange Park area, some delis and uh, interesting, some crystals and all that. Uh, if I were to click on the word donut here, we'll actually narrow it down. So this is actually really interesting data that, as a business owner, I can use to figure out where the best location for my new store is going to be. Unfortunately, as you can see, it's, very, it's not very consumable, right? So it's a, st a, a store like Subway or McDonald's or Donut Dunkin' Donuts, can't really consume this data, but I, it'd be really nice to know where are there are poorly rated stores at that I can put my store near to potentially, you know, give them the rub a little bit, you know, kind of, kind of give them a little pressure and make, it, make them better and make me better. So that's my goal here is I want to get uh, a listing of stores that are donut shops near me. So what I've done, and I also want to find out where the population hubs are as well. So let me bring over Excel here. So keep in mind, uh, as you can see this, we're looking at up top here. Let me kind of zoom in a little closer here. We're seeing in the URL, Orange Park, and then we're also seeing the word donuts up in the URL. Now, because, because, uh, um, because we have those, those, those pieces up there, uh, that means that URL is actually we can pass items into the URL and ultimately get a data set out of it. So my goal is to convert this HTML page into a data set. Now, Liz is already asking the question, is M easier than DAX? Um, you know, DAX is fairly easy as far as it feels like an Excel language, right? Um, but M is, is quite different. It's not really any, any comparison to DAX because it's really more of a workflow. And you'll, and you'll see it in a moment here. So I'll let, I'll let you be the, uh, uh, the answer to that, Liz. So let me show it to you uh, by the end. And I'm curious what you think of it, if you don't mind, Liz. Uh, come back to that. So let me open up Excel. Now, what I've done, okay, let me bring Excel over. Well, oh, there we go. I brought to the wrong window. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm just open up a brand new worksheet. Now, first of all, what I want to show you, just kind of the basics here. Keep in mind, this is a free plugin. You can use this when you get on the phone with me today. Uh, I'm going to go to Power Query, which is the plugin that I've downloaded, and you'll notice a whole bunch of places I can get data from. So if I were to kind of zoom in a little bit closer here, there we go. You can see I can bring data from files, XML files, CSV files, and all that. I can get data from databases, all the databases you, you would think to see. And also, I can just go to other data sources that are less common data sources, like SharePoint and Hadoop and, and Azure and all sorts of interesting places here. Now, in my case, I want to bring the data. Let's, let's, let's start with a, just a, a really interesting example. I'll start with uh, um, online search. 
Now, first of all, I, like, how many times have you had to go out and search for a list of your developer, search for a list of state names or country names to populate a drop-down list in the application? So that's what I kind of want, I want to start with here. Now, I'm going to do a search here. And this search, now you'll notice I can, I can sign in. Uh, this sign-in that I'm doing right now is actually going to sign me in to my organization. All right. Okay, let me just go ahead and quickly sign in here. Now, by signing into my organization, when I do a search, it's going to search the web, but it's also going to search my organizations to see if I have queries like this already out there. So let's search for uh, country names. I'm going to call this look for a list of countries. Here we go. I'll hit enter. And up comes a list of countries from, you'll see right now, I'm looking at uh, public data sources, 16,000 of them. And there's also private data sources, nine. So if I hit the organization ones, these are the ones that uh, looks like uh, ones that people have already published out in my organization. In my case, I'm going to do with public ones in my case. Uh, that's an interesting. List of major league baseball teams. Uh, that must be Devin. If I go to public data sources here, we're seeing a list of countries right here. So this is actually, if you look at the data source down below, there's my URL. It's from a Wikipedia page. And if I were to actually click on that, let me just kind of click on that so you can see what the data source looks like originally. This is what the data source looks like originally. It's a web page with an HTML table. And in that HTML table, we're seeing a list of all the different countries in the, in the world and what the populations are. So let's go back to Excel and let's convert that into a data set. So I'm going to hit this little edit button. I could hit the load button and just go ahead and load it. But I'm going to hit the edit button just to kind of show you what the basics of Power Query are going to look like here. So in my case, as I do this, it's downloading the query. It's connecting to Wikipedia in this case. It brought the data set over. Let me kind of maximize this so you can see a little better here. And what we're seeing is a list of countries now. So if I were to right click on population, I can transform this into uh, uh, upper casing and lower casing. Now it's recognizing this population column right now as a string data. It's going to do its best to see if, it, if this is text or string or whatever. But in my case, I know this is a whole number, so I'll go ahead and select whole number. Now, the transformations that I can do are quite different. I go to transform now, I can do rounding, I can go ahead and do absolute values and fractional kind of, kind of computations. So the transformations you can do are contextual based on the data type, and it automatically kind of figures that out for you. We also can go over here and say, well, I don't really care about the percentage of the world population. Interesting that China has 20% of the world populations in China. I'm going to go ahead and remove that, though. Uh, maybe this date right here, if I were to transform this into a date, oh, sorry, change the type of it into a date, there we go. Now the transformations I can do will be things like uh, date only, I can do a year. Let's get the year of this country here in this case. So this is the year they actually did the census in this case. So by doing this, now I've got a, a very easy, you know, four clicks, I did, I did four transformations. I can, again, remove more columns I don't care about and all that. And look what's happening on the right, though. On the right, as I do this, it's tracking every step that I've done so far. Now, at any point in time, I can click uh, the X here to remove that step or reconfigure the step. So that little source that you see right here, I can click on it, and I can ultimately reconfigure where I'm getting this data from. But I can name the query, and when I'm all done, I keep mind they're changing this all the time. So if your screen looks a little bit different than my screen, it's because you're using a slightly old version of Power Query. They change just about once a month, though. Every four to six weeks, I get a new refresh of Power Query with new features, new um, uh, making it more accessible and all that. So in my case, let's go through and let's, let's go ahead and load this into my sheet. So now I'm going to hit Close and Load, too. Now you'll see a whole bunch of options here. Let me zoom in a little closer. This is something a little different now. I'm going to create a new worksheet, or I'll use an existing worksheet. And I can also load this into a power pivot model by checking that one box down below. I'm going to keep it friendly. Just hit the existing workbook and hit load. And there we go. Now we have a list of countries, and we have a list of sources where it got the data from, and a list of populations. And I can now start to go through and slice and dice. That's interesting here. This one, one country has 56 people in it. Who would have thought, huh? All right. So it's funny when you know everybody in the country by, by first name. So let's go through now and actually do a more applicable example. So this time what I want to do is I want to find out, hey, where are the donut stores? So rather than do a query against this data, what I'm going to do this time is I'm going to do a uh, data source from a website. 
Now you already saw the website before. Let me kind of copy in the URL that you saw before, the Yelp URL that is. And I'm going to paste that URL in here. The only difference is this time I'm pointing to an API versus the actual website. So Yelp actually extends a uh, open API that you can, you can tap into. Again, I'm looking at Orange Park. I changed that. And I also changed the word, uh, the, the donut word that you saw earlier as well. There we go, donut here. All right, so when I go ahead and hit OK, what it's going to do is going to go out on the website. It's going to find some data. Now, as you can see, in this case, it's running a JSON query. So web service call there. And from that JSON query, it found a business listing. So if I were to click on a listing of businesses, there we go. What we're going to see, though, is as I do this, let me kind of go back a little bit here. As I do this, and I were to hit the home button, for example, I have one of these icons right here. This, 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 these icons to kind of see uh, what, what you know. It's going to show me an XML data set. Well, that XML data set does me no good at all. And we're seeing uh, back over here under, under um, uh, if I were to right click on this list, there's really only one option I can do here, and that's that's to convert the XML array into a proper table. So I'm going to click on two table, and there's no kind of delimiter or anything, so I'll hit OK. And what this is allowing me to do now is to say, all right, well, what do you want to do now? All right, well, I, we now have a table, and it has the word record in it, but you see this little separator icon right here. This separator icon is saying, inside that XML, I found all these columns that you see right here. So I'm going to hit OK, and that's going to blow this table up and show me the first 20 records from that Yelp Yelp site. These are all the donut stores near me, and sure enough, I go to the right here. We should be able to see, okay, where's some uh, donut stores, hopefully. There we go, Dunkin' Donuts, OMG Donuts, uh, Krispy Kreme, and so on and so on. Some, some donuts in my coffee houses, Donut King, and all this. All right, so let's figure out where to position my store. Now, this is also, it found foreign keys here, essentially. So in this case, it found what neighborhoods do you have. So if I were to click on this little, little button right here, it would blow it up even more and show me a list of all the neighborhoods. Now, I'm going to undo that now. I don't, I don't really want that blown up, so let me go ahead and unexpand that. But it would ultimately blow my 20 records up and show me a record per neighborhood. Or maybe I want to get a record per actual review. But in my case, this average rating here, I just care about the rolled up rating. Now, I could, I could go granular down and get down to the individual rating level, uh, but let's, let's start here. I want to change its type of this rating into a number, a decimal number. So now I can actually build bar graphs against it. And my next thing I want to do is I want to create the full address. I want to create one big address here. So there's my address it looks like right there. I want to get this closer to a state and zip code. There we go. And a city. Where's my city here? Let's find my city. There's my city right there. I'm going to kind of move those a little closer together also so I can kind of see them all next side by side. All right, so between all these columns right here, I have a full address. So let's go ahead and, and parse this into a full address. So I have uh, 123 Main Street, for example, and I want to put a space and the word Jacksonville. So I'm going to right click, and let's go ahead and merge those columns together. There we go. It's going to pop open a quick interface, and I want to put a space there. All right, there we go. I'll hit OK. So now I've got uh, a part of a full address. Now I need to do a Jacksonville comma Florida. So let's go ahead and right click on those. Merge those columns together, and let's put a comma there. Of course, I could do a comma space. I can do I can do commas here, whatever. I'll do a, I'll do a custom one here, and I'll do a comma space just so we have a look a little bit more adventure there. All right, and then last but not least, there we go, Jacksonville, comma Florida. I need to get that zip code in there as well. So I'm going to right click and say merge column. And let's do a let's get that zip code in there as well, just so we can go ahead and and, uh, and have the full address in there all equalized out. There we go. I'll do a space and hit OK. All right, so there we go. So we now have the full address there. I can now right click and let's rename that column so that makes something that makes a little more sense, like full address. Of course, spaces are allowed. I'm going to leave it as is right there. All right, so we did about what eight or nine steps there, right? Total. Uh, and I can do other things like in the review count, all, you know, write data type as well. And as you can see, in this case, it actually recognized it was a number. And I don't need to change the data type at all. I can, I can be explicit with it and make it a whole number. But it actually already saw it was a number in this case. And you can see that because it actually appended that data to the right versus the left in most cases. All right, so what we've done is we've taken some, some data that was, keep on, traditionally a website, not very usable data. 
We've done all these steps with it that were very easy to do. It was all right-click motions, right? There was no coding involved so far. Very easy actions to be able to do. And now we have a query that we can now name into uh, Donut Shops. All right, so we have a query now ready to go. With this now done, we could actually append in other data with these merge queries or bring in other data. We can also remove duplicates if we have, haven't have any duplicates. We can say, well, it's good enough. Just give me the top you know, 20 stores or whatever. So lots of other stuff we can do, but in my case, I feel comfortable that I'm ready to go. I'm going to go ahead and load this, uh, this, this, load this data. All right, and two it's also going to load it in Power Pivot. All right, I'm going to hit Add to, to Data Model to load it in Power Pivot. I'll hit OK. Now we have a workbook ready to go. As an analyst, we can now start to research these stores and find out where we don't want to build closer to and where we want to build closer to. Now the reason I only got 20 stores, by the way, is my I'm not actually uh, licensing the API. If you don't license it, they only give you 20 results. If you license it, they'll give you more than that. So it's up to you on how you want to build that. Uh, in my case, I, it wasn't mission critical for me to see more than 20 stores. All right, so with that now done, I can actually hit the share button, and I can share that with other people on my, in my company. So it's going to take that data, I'm going to share it with everybody, and now they'll actually be able to search for this. I can create documentation for it. Uh, this can be blessed by a data steward, steward and all that. So when I go to Power Query and they do a search, uh, they can do a search for donuts. And we'll see that under uh, uh, organizational data sources once it's been blessed. Right now it has not been blessed. So lots of cool stuff we can do with this, right? Now, what I've done is I've taken the data from a Yelp website, and I have also data over here that I've previously received from the Census Bureau. Now, this data has things like all right, how many households are in a certain zip code, uh, what is the income level of certain zip codes, uh, what is the home values and the population uh, age that are young, that are old, and so on and so on. Again, this is all public record data that was all received from the Census Bureau, from the demographic data from the Census. So, to make my decision, I want to correlate a number of households with the Yelp ratings to find out where does it not make sense to locate. So let's do that now. Let's go ahead and let's hit insert. I'm going to build a map, so I'm going to hit the little map icon here and do launch Power Map. Now Power Map is a free add-in for Excel, for Excel 2013 only. And this plugin requires Excel 2013. Uh, you can download today, so search for Power, power uh, um, uh, you can search for uh, Power Map, and it's part of the whole Power BI stack. The goal of Power Map is to tell a story, to ultimately tell a story about how BI can interface with you and, and all that. It's a great way of visualizing data. A question here from Miguel, uh, and the question is, uh, in Power Query, is there a limitation number of rows displayed? Yeah, it does give you a, a, a preview of the data as you start to build these Power Queries against. But once you hit load, is actually going to suck down all the data. So I have, I have some that have millions of records, and I have some that have just a couple hundred records that we saw here. So but in, the, in the preview pane, just to make it uh, pop, just make it faster, it's only going to show you a certain amount of rows, and you can page down to see more rows if you wish. So this is Power Map. It's a great visualization tool for mapping type data. Most companies want to see sales by you know, sales territory, by state, by country, whatever. Well, in my case, I happen to have a zip code out there, and the zip code is called Geography ID. If I just click on that, it shows, hey, that's my, that's my area right here. This is my zip codes all in the Jacksonville, Florida region right now. And when I hit next, I now want to visualize that by the number of pop, the amount of population in a certain zip code. All right, here we go. Well, now it's starting to make sense. Now, this is very touch friendly. I'm going to put my fingers on this so the camera will look all funny here. But I can actually you know, use this to kind of pivot around and look at data different ways and do all sorts of cool things like that. I can, I can use my two fingers to kind of you know, uh, you know, circle around the city and, and get a nice aerial view. So in my case, again, this is the higher the bar is the more the population. If I don't have my fingers, by the way, I can use these little clicks like this. I can put uh, uh, labels on it so I can see where the different areas are. I could put a theme on it where it looks more realistic. I can zoom in really close to see exactly down to the uh, street level what these places look like. So what I really care about, though, in my case, is what are these different zip codes and what the populations are. So the higher the bar right now, the more the population. It would not make sense for me to locate this, this uh, donut store where there's only 4,000 citizens to actually buy my donuts. 
Uh, now I can visualize this in a number of ways. So you can see there's bubbles, for example. So the smaller the bubble, the smaller the population uh, density. Or I can do a heat map. So we're having a little heat map. I kind of draw, roll out now. We're seeing uh, the heat map. Uh, of course, the bubbles, the, the dots here are not uh, concentrated enough to really get a good read of it. You can see where Jaxl's population hubs are here in this case. Or I can hit the little region icon. The region icon will draw a box around anything that's a, a zip code in my case, a city, a state, a country, whatever you want. Now, when I say whatever you want, they're going to make it available for other things, but it has to be some kind of address level type data. Now, in my case, I'm three clicks in so far, right? Uh, I want to make this where the, the color scale is a little bit more dark where the, pop, the more population hubs are. So I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to change my color scale down, and now we're seeing the darker the color, like right here, for example, the more population density there is, especially my zip code where we, my office is at right now. So I can see where does it make sense to actually locate an office in that zip code. Now, all right, now my next step. I, this is one layer that we're seeing right now. If I were to hit the Add Layer button, I now want to overlay the donut stores on top of that. So by hitting Add Layer, it's going to ask me, okay, well, what do you want to put on this now? You want address? You want zip codes? What do you want? Well, in my case, I care about the donut shops uh, when we just did, and I'm looking for a full address. And I think if I scroll down, there's my full address column we created a little earlier. When I check that, let's go through, and now you'll notice that I can build this map based on any level of data. Okay, it could be based on countries and state, states, uh, lat long, uh, XY coordinates like that. Or in my case, it's going to be based on a full address. Now, typically, it's going to find those addresses or figure out the data like it did before and guess is this a city or a state or a country or whatever. In this case, though, I went ahead and just found that it, I had to kind of select full address. When I hit next, now I want to find the Yelp rating. So somewhere in here is my average rating. There it is. I'll check that. Now, what I'm looking at now, and I'm missing gaps of data, as you see here. I should have gone, gotten got more data here. But there's only one donut store here, it looks like. And this, this is the address. Let's kind of zoom in closer to that address here. And I can see this. they're in a little shopping strip right here. It's only one donut store in all this city called Middleburg, Florida. So it may be a good opportunity for me to build a store because it's a decent-sized population hub here. So if I, if I zoom out a little bit more, looks like we have a big gap in donut stores right over here in the Palm Coast, the Fruit Cove area. There's nothing over there, it looks like. So there's some good little opportunities we have here. Um, so this is a, a really good opportunity to figure out where I want to build. So again, I'm looking at a line graph. I can look at this as a bubble chart or whatever I want here also. The other neat thing we can do with Power Map is, again, the whole goal of Power Map is to tell a story. So, if you want to tell a story, one of the neat things we can do is I can create a video. So think about you as a director here. This is a, a tour that you have on the left. If I hit this little gear box here, I want the, this part of the story to be a, a top-level look at the city. And that top-level look, I want to kind of rotate a rope around the city. So let's do a little figure eight here. Maybe I'll do a fly. Let's do a fly over here. And I want to fly over for maybe a good chunk of the city here. And let's just do this for maybe five, you know four or five seconds here of that time, and I'll make this maybe a ten-second kind of kind of flyover. Next, if I go ahead and hit Add Scene again on this scene, when I click on it, I'm going to focus on a certain part of the city. Like I think it makes sense to build. How about over in this area right here? So I'm going to zoom in really close this area, and I'll focus in on a certain segment of of the city and I'm focusing on this one area here. So this time, I'm going to again do six seconds. I'm going to do a three-second kind of transition right now or so. And let's do maybe a, how about a figure eight this time, or a push-in, or how about I do, I'll do a, um, a circle over this part of the city, and I'll, I'll do a, a fairly fast circle here. So it's all done instead. I can preview this by hitting Play Tour, and we'll see it kind of start out. It's kind of flying over the city as a video. It's going to have a little bit of lag right now because I'm doing a video over web conference. Now it's going to come and focus in on that one part. There we go. It's going to zoom in on that one area and kind of fly over and circle over that one area. So picture yourself going through and telling a story with this in the backdrop where you can go through and actually create that video right here, and you can actually uh, integrate that into PowerPoint. 
So telling that story, having your executives tell that story with meaningful data is a way to create actionable business intelligence. Now we can figure out, imagine them being able to say, uh, as you can see, this part of the city looks to be really a hotbed. There's not much competition there. If we locate here, I think we can really, it's this one donut store here has low ratings. So I think it can really be a, a much, much better uh, uh, position for the county. So lots of really, really neat stuff we can do with this. Crime data is a really good way of telling a story. Lots of really, really neat data you can look at. So I'm going to then close this down now. And let's do a, an, another interesting example. So hopefully you found that one, the first one interesting. Again, that was actionable intelligence that we can actually use as we decided where to build our store. Well, other interesting things we can do. Let's, let's go ahead and go out to um, uh, a website here. The website I want to use is called boxofficemojo.com. And this is an example you can do in your home also. I, I may be a little too fast for, for this webinar to do it step by step, but it's a really interesting example we can do. All right, so what we want to do is I'm going to look for um, I'm going to look for all-time international best movies of all time. So let's uh, let's go ahead and so first of all, what do you think as as I kind of do this? Uh, I'm going to open up on the side here. I'm going to open up a, a copy of Word here so I can get a, a example for later. So think to yourself, what do you think the best most most uh, um, awesome movie of all time as far as revenue goes is across the whole world? Uh, I say all time, I mean from you know way, way long time ago. So think to yourself what that might be. I'll give you a second to kind of think about that. And as we go down, there we go. I'm going to hit the, uh, um, let's see here, there we go, and look at international movies of all time. So I'm going to select, first of all, all time. Okay. And I'm going to hit uh, worldwide revenue. Well, as we can see, Avatar is the uh, highest grossing movie of all time. So interesting, huh? So it looks like Avatar followed by Titanic. So, so Titanic kind of downer of a movie, $2.1 billion worldwide. We also have the Avengers that were up there and Harry Potter. Okay, so next question I want to ask now is I want to create some actionable intelligence that will help me figure out what studio I should go sell that movie to. And all the data I have is in this page right here where I'm looking at you know, 1, 1 to 100, 2 to 100, and so on and so on. So I have about five, about 577 movies here that I want to basically load into a data set. Now, if I look again, look at the URL up top. We're seeing up top here a URL page number one. Now I got that by actually clicking on you know, one of these pages and going back to 100 here. So let me go ahead and snag this URL right here. Okay, and as you can see, it's not really something I can consume. I could copy and paste all this to a to a to a web page. But that's going to be our, to a, uh, an Excel spreadsheet, but not very, not very good, is it? So let's find a way to actually use this in a more uh, concise way for my analyst. Okay. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to open up Excel again. I'll just open up a brand new flavor of Excel. There we go. Create a new workbook. Now this time, open up Power Query again. I'm going to hit From Web again. And there's so many good data sources out there. Matter of fact, I I'm going to tweet right now, in case you're following me, at Brian Knight. Uh, Adam Jorgensen just tweeted some interesting data sources for public record data. So I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and tweet that so uh, others can see that. And he is, his tweet is now off my screen. There it goes. Where is Adam at here? All right, there he is. All right, so I'm going to tweet this. If you're following me at Brian Knight, you'll now see a whole bunch of uh, thousands of public data sources uh, that, that Adam just tweeted as well. So let me go out here real quick and get from Bob Box Office but Mojo. Here's my URL in case you're following along at home. That's the URL you can do uh, on the recordings later. I'll hit OK. Now what's going to happen now is it's going to go onto that website and hopefully find me some data. So in this case, what we can see, we kind of drill into this. OK, there we go. It found a table and it found the HTML page. So if I go to eight, the, the table zero, and I, let's go ahead and hit the edit button. I can right click on it and say edit. I can load it right immediately. So I'm going to hit edit. Now a question here from Lee, which is a very applicable question, is how do I refresh this data now? Well, first of all, we're seeing a, a preview that we can refresh right here. Now, other than that, you'll find a refresh button in the Power Query tab as well. Or we can also refresh it on a periodic basis as well. If, they, if the website refreshes, we can be very refreshed also. Also, SharePoint can refresh this inside the Power BI uh, site type 
for, for SharePoint. That could be refreshed as well on a schedule. So lots of good stuff we can do there on that. All right. A uh, question here from Stacy. Can that list be emailed out later for uh, if you don't use? Yeah, so it, I'll put it in the chat window as well. It's actually, if you just go to twitter.com forward slash Brian Knight, you don't have to have a Twitter address. You'll, you'll, you'll be able to just do it right there and see and see that out. So Brian, uh, twitter.com forward slash Brian Knight, uh, and it will be on my, on my notes as well. You don't have to have Twitter to actually see the URL I just, I just tweeted. All right, so the few things wrong with this data. First thing, our year. If I want to use this year, I see things like uh, tilde marks and all those kind of things. I want to replace those tilde marks with something a little bit more applicable. So I'm going to right click and I'll go ahead and rename this, uh, sorry, I, I want to replace the data in it. So I'm going to uh, replace data. There we go. And I want to replace the tilde, the caret symbol, excuse me, the caret symbol with nothing. So we'll get rid of that. Now all the caret symbols are now gone. Again, you can see right here, a little gearbox next to it. I can click on that gearbox and change what I'm replacing over here if I wanted to as well. All right, I'm going to call this, this, uh, this query I'm running now movies. And there's something in this query that I don't really care about. So for example, the percentage of gross for overseas versus domestic, I'm going to right click and I'm going to remove those columns. I don't really care about that. Um, but I do care about these being numbers, though. This, this, this amount of revenue we're getting worldwide versus domestic versus, uh, 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 versus overseas. I'm going to right click. I'm going to make sure that, that this data is actually not text data, but it's going to be a, a currency data instead. So I'll make this a decimal number. Okay, so there we go. See how it immediately changed the format of it as well? All right, so we're, and I also, I'll keep everything else. We can remove column. What right, is I removed a, a column? I replaced this data, and I also converted its data type here. So this, this, all this work has now been done, and we have this new query called movies. All right, perfect. I can do tons more, but what I really want to do is I only have, right now, 100 movies. I want to see the entire list that you saw before. All right, so if I go through, let me go ahead and, and, uh, and uh, save this query off real quick. So let me go ahead and close and load this. All right, so I've now saved this query. It's called Movies Now. And I'm, all I'm looking at right now looks to be, uh, oh, it looks to be 100 movies. So I've got a problem, right? So I want to have this, be able to pass in a page number and have it go back. So I'm going to edit this query again. I want to be able to pass in a page number and have it return the number of movies on that page number. So to do this, we have to open up that language called M. M is a Mary or Microsoft. I'll go to View. And I'll say advanced editor. All right, so back to Liz. Liz, if you're still there, not Liz, my, not my Liz, but the other Liz, uh, go ahead and watch this part because this is going to be the query language you were asking about before. And how does it resemble M? Well, as you can see, it looks very complex at first. But in reality, it's a workflow-based engine. In other words, every line that we see here is a line that I did through a right-click action. So we're seeing replace table dot replace value with uh, with a, with a, uh, a caret symbol with nothing, for example, in this column. You don't have to learn most of this language. You have to know how to do two lines of code in most cases. You're probably never going to code this language like this. You just have to know how to take it to the next level, which is what we're going to do right now. I want to create a function out of this query. So I'm gonna, in other words, I'm replacing, I'm turning it from a, a ad hoc query into a query that's reusable that I can pass values in, like a store procedure or a function. So in my case, to, create, to make this a function, I first need a parameter. The parameter that I'm going to call, I'll call this page number. And I'll do an equal sign and a, a greater than sign. This is basically going to create a parameter that I can use over and over again. All right, now, see that page number that we have right here? Well, I'm going to take that number one out. I'm going to do two double quotes, two and percents. And that's going to basically say, whatever I put in between these and percents is going to be something that is going to be a, a parameter I'm going to pass in. So I want to pass that, that page number in. So I could just do this, page number right there, and it's going to pass that page number in. However, I want to make this a little cleaner. I want to go ahead and I'm going to pass a number in, and I want to convert that into a text to append into that URL there. So to do that, really simple. I'm going, to, I'm going to type in number dot to text. And in case you're curious what to do, you'll see down here as well, like table dot replace value, table dot, you know, a whole bunch of stuff that we're doing here that looks like this, take dot text. So it's going to, I'm going to pass a number in. It's going to convert it to text. 
and then it's going to ultimately pass it into that query now. So let me zoom out here. Let me hit done. Now it's going to convert that now into a function that I can hit the invoke button in here, and I can type a value of like page four, hit OK, and now we're seeing like think movies like 21 Jump Street, which is definitely not on page one of all time most seen movies. Uh, the Blind Side, Runaway Bride, those kind of ones, Mulan. So, all right, so it looks like we're definitely seeing uh, a later page in this case. I'm going to hit the X button here to uninvoke that, and now I'm just looking at the function now. So let me go ahead and close and load that again. So now, it's not actually going to show me that query anymore, right? There's nothing to show. I only have, let's see, load is actually disabled because it's now an infun a function. But if my user hits, clicks this word invoke here, it's going to actually invoke it and call the function. So in my case, though, I want to invoke it automatically through another mechanism. I want to pass in the number one through five. So think of this from a sales perspective. From a sales guy, what he can do is, our, from a recruiter perspective, he can loop over monster.com and pass in the numbers and download the entire record set of all the jobs that are being posted right now and all the candidates and all that. So on eBay, I'm going to suck down a list of all the people I'm competing with on eBay. Lots of cool stuff you can do with this. In my case, though, I want to, I want to pass in one through six and get back all the movies. So when I go to insert, I'm sorry, a pay, a pay query again, I want to write one more query. This query is going to be a blank query, which means I can basically interface, I can write whatever I want to, in other words. In my case, though, I'm going to do a little equal sign. I'm going to start with a little, um, oh gosh, what do they call that? It's called the bracket, right? Curly brace. I'm going to do one dot dot. Um, how would I do? I think it's one through page. I think we saw six pages there. So I'll do one through six, and I'll hit the curly brace again. Now, when I hit enter, all it's going to do is going to convert that into values one through six, an array essentially. Now, I could go through and create an Excel table and type in one, two, three, four, five, six, and do it that way also. I find this a little bit easier myself, but whatever works for you, you can import an Excel spreadsheet and merge it that way as well. No, no worries, whatever you want to do. All right, so when I right-click on this, only one action only matters. You'll see it up top as well, to table. So I'm going to convert that into a table. Again, there's nothing I need to do to separate this. I'm just going to hit OK. And now that array has been converted into a table. So my next step is to ultimately is going to be to have that value, one through six, passed in to that function that we created a few moments ago. So to do that, I'm going to right-click. I'm going to say, oh, they've moved it. That's right. It used to be in the right-click motion. Now I'm going to find it under uh, uh, Add Column, and you'll find Add uh, Insert Custom Column. So when I click on that, what it's going to do is going to open up a little interface here. Let me kind of zoom in a little closer here so you can see that where I'm going to write a custom column. Now, a custom column can call other queries. It can cleanse data different ways. But in my case, let's call this just a uh, you know, uh, movie page or whatever you want to call that. Uh, what I want to do, I'm going to, I'm going to say, let's, let's call that movie function that I did earlier and pass in the page number, column one. Let me close parenthesis that. There we go. Oop, oop. Wrong kind of parenthesis. There we go. We have, see we have no syntax problems. So what's going to happen here again? What's happening is it's going to call that movies query I did before. It's going to pass in number one, which, which triggers a function for page one. Then it'll do the same thing for two. So what's basically happening is a loop is happening. It's going to pass in number one through six for each page there. So when I hit OK, let's see if it worked. Ah, it appeared to have worked. And what, what's happening is now we have a, a table. I can click on the table, actually see the table, but I'm going to go ahead and hit the little separator icon. There's all my columns for each page. So if I do, if I click, click OK here, hopefully, what's going to happen is going to take all those pages and I should see 577 movies. I'll hit OK, and there we go. I'm definitely seeing page one. That, that number there is for page number. Page two now, and so on and so on. Page three, and so on and so on. Now you'll notice as I do this, a little bit of an hourglass as I scroll down. Back over to Miguel's question. As I do this, it's basically calling out for the next for the next uh, few hundred rows for the preview. So I'm seeing. Brian, if you can hear me, your sound just went out. Uh oh. Oh, there you are now. Here I am. Okay, sorry about that. All right. Sorry, I think I think I just. 
All right, so what we're, what we're looking at here, though, is a list of all the movies starring. Now, ask yourself, our list, I'm gonna, you're going to be my guinea pig here. Who do you think the top movie of all, top, top uh, grossing uh, producer or uh, uh, movie, movie studio is of all time? Liz, what do you think? Which Liz? The other Liz left. She you, you, Liz. Uh, you, Liz. You said the top grossing uh, studio. Um, Paramount. Paramount, okay. All right, so ask yourself. Go ahead and, uh, and type it in the uh, question window if you think you think they'll play along at home. Let's see who can win this also. So I'm going to right-click on, on the, uh, this, this option right here just to make sure these are actually numbers. They indeed look to be numbers, but I'm just going to go ahead and, make, and confirm that here just to be really, really hyper-anal here. And let's, let's let me do that. All right, so go ahead and, and type in your own answer here. What, what, what studio do you think is going to be the best? Uh, John Philippe is thinking Universal. We have a lot of Universal people here, it looks like. Uh, that's our only answer so far. So uh, it's all our bust here. All right. So what I want to do now is I want to see that, see the results. So we have uh, uh, Don who says Disney. All right. Only three answers so far. Nobody's willing to take a, take a gamble here, I guess. Uh, so let's go ahead and load this into a spreadsheet. All right, load this out to a spreadsheet, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and load this also in the Power Pivot. All right, Charles says DreamWorks. All right, cool. We've got some WB uh, call-outs here from William. All right, so there we go. We now have a list of all the movies and uh, their studios. So let's build a report to find out who won from my list here. If you haven't answered yet, go ahead and, and, and play along if you want to play along. I, I, I want you to commit to a, to a uh, studio here. All right, so Liz, uh, uh, let's find out if you're right here also. I will tell you, I have the right answer in my chat window right now by somebody. All right, so yeah, somebody's, uh, a number of people have already got the right answer in here. Brian Knight Studios, I like it, Charles. All right, so let's go ahead and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer that question. Uh, I can answer a number of ways. I have a Power Pivot spreadsheet out there already, but uh, so I could go into Power Pivot and create, create a uh, report to look at that. In my case, though, so let's, let's make it a little sexier. Let's go over to Power View and see it through Power View. All right, so I wanted to insert in Power View. This Power View is part of Power BI stack again. It's all part of Excel 2013, and you already own this today if you already have Excel 2013. Let me go ahead and just roll all this data back here, and I just care about a really simple example. Just show me the studios here. All right, so let's find us a studio. There's my studios. All right, and let's find their worldwide uh, revenue. Okay, so I need to look for worldwide revenue there. Let's convert that into a bar chart, and let's find out who the winner is. All right, Liz, who'd you say again? Paramount. Paramount, okay, so let's see how we did here. All right, so I went ahead and uh, I have my bar chart now done. I'm going to sort this, not by movie studio name, but maybe by uh, oh, worldwide revenue. And here's the answer. Drum roll, please. Up, oh, Buena Vista. We can thank uh, the word the movie Frozen, which if you have daughters at home, you've seen way too many times. Uh, we can thank Frozen for that now. Uh, Warner Brothers can thank uh, somebody else for that also. We'll talk about that in a second here. So we have Paramount is, is, a, is a distant, a distant uh, uh, far one there, but still pretty doing pretty good there. Uh, they've made about $23 billion since, uh, since the opening, uh, to opening day here, uh, where Buena Vista has made close to $40 billion with a B on movies. Crazy amount of money, huh? So let's see when, this theater, when those two different studios actually started to make their most money. So we can do that by looking at this uh, more of a ranking period here, right? So I'm going to click on, like, a, I want to see domestic money versus the overseas money versus the, the, the rank, uh, maybe how about do the... Um, the average ranking, maybe. So let's do the average, uh, uh, the count of movies they actually have ranked here. So let's count those movies. All right. Uh, and then let's see this by studio also. So this report's a little bit more gnarly. Let's convert that into maybe a scatter plot. Does we actually make make more sense? There we go. Look how close Warner Brothers is to Buena Vista there. So they have 87 hits that they've done to make that money. Uh, where Warner Brothers has 90 hits. So really, really interesting there. So I want to find out, is this a new phenomenon? So this is something that has happened recently. So to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag year down under play access, and let's find out when Warner Brothers and Buena Vista started kicking in. So if you go back to 1967, it looks like Paramount was the only theater that had a movie that ranked in the top 500 back in 72. Uh, sorry, 67 is back here. I, I, is, I have no idea. Probably Disney there, I assume, uh, before it became Buena Vista. 
So if I were to hit the play button now, we can see each of the theaters kind of go up, our studios go up and go down. Nobody really has any kind of long-lasting effect until about the 90s. Now we're starting to see money, uh, money really start to trickle in here. So let me, let me pause right there. If we were to select Warner Brothers right here, I passed Paramount, excuse me, but you get the idea. We'll hit the play button and we can watch Paramount go from year to year, starting way down here. We're seeing Paramount kind of go in and they have a one-hit wonder every maybe three or four years. And now I started to gain some momentum right now. Oh, there we go. They had a real big movie right there. But something happened that year. And that's the question, right? There's these some things that are happening, these themes that are happening. And what are those themes? So let's build one more report. And to do this, I'm going to create one more Power View report against the same data. This time, what I want to see is I want to see the actual movies, the title of the movies, by the worldwide revenue. And let me get the domestic and all that as well. What the heck? And I want to go ahead and group this by a studio. So I'm going to drag studio down the tile by. Now we're seeing a list of all the studios. And inside this, this array right here, this says table, what I want to see is, let me make a little bar chart inside this. Let me make a little bar chart by going up here, something bar chart. All right, so that's, oh, that's, that's kind of a nasty bar chart because it's all clustered, but you get the idea. That's showing us the worldwide revenue and all that, the Blair Witch Project in this case. All right, so. What I want to do in my case, though, is I want to sort this not by title of the movie, but maybe by the worldwide revenue here. All right, so all right, we already I already get the answer from Buena Vista. We can see Buena Vista. Uh, well, that bar chart looks pretty gnarly, doesn't it? Let's let's actually make that into a table instead. There we go. Same exact data just into a table instead. So we can see it looks like uh, I am sorting by the wrong thing here. I'm sorting by. Uh, um, by the things descending, but you get the idea, or ascending. So it looks like, as you scroll down, uh, Marvel Avengers was actually, that was wrong. Uh, Marvel Avengers is the number one ranking make movie in the uh, in worldwide revenue uh, for, for Buena Vista, for Disney. Uh, now, what do you guys think as far as um, for, uh, who's that one? Warner Brothers. What do you think, Liz? Play along with me here. Um, Warner Brothers, I'm, thinking, movie I'm Brothers. thinking Harry Potter. I think you probably are right, and you are right. Harry Potter not once, but multiple times. So this is a way of really, we, we, we had a really complex question, relatively complex, that would have, take an analyst some time to kind of go through, that we were able to answer the question fairly quickly here by you know, one click, three clicks, and ultimately we were able to drive an answer very, very fast here. We found the number one studio of all time and the number one movie in that studio. And there's lots of other stuff we can do. We can now publish this online, and we're going to find out if I go to my online website here for for um, our oh, there we go. I'm going to go to my little sandbox here. I'm going to open up my Power BI website. Now, this is the same thing we saw before, but this is going to be more of an online presence of it. What I'm what I'm signing in right now. If you, and if you need help, we actually have a training class on this, of course, and we also um, help implementation of this as well. So. I'm opening up a Power by Power BI website. Now this is uh, using SharePoint Online with Office 365, and what we're seeing is it's all the same report you saw before, but very an online kind of. We can also see here that we have we can ask questions in plain old English, and as I check those queries in, we'll see under uh, Power BI. As I check the queries in, we can actually see those queries and approve the queries to be published for my other users. So we're about to wrap up, but let's just, let's just ask one question. So rather than have to ask a question the old-fashioned way, I can say, you know, show me the population by country. And when I, when I see it's actually contacting Power BI right now, it will actually build a report for me in a second, and there it goes. So I got the data. It's going to turn that hopefully into a map because I'm asking, I'm asking a question that's more geographical-based question. I got to enter again. And I could ask questions like, uh, uh, by country, that are polluting. And there's a thesaurus behind the scenes that basically derives all this. For some reason, it's not actually showing me a map right now. I'll have to refresh this. The actually, it looks like it's doing it right now, but it's taking its time. All right, so uh, let me open up for questions here. We have a, a few minutes left, about two minutes left, looks like. Uh, what kind of questions do you guys have left? I hope this is uh, useful for you. Of course, it was all recorded, so you can go back and kind of play along with the examples later. Uh, again, all the queries that you build can be shared with others, and you can use that to kind of uh, build a repository of that data.
There it goes. It's logical too. It's a sweet time there for some reason. So that's, our, that's our countries that are polluting. There's my countries. If I search this way, it gives me a list of countries in a map. So I'm asking a geographic kind of question. All right. Well, again, if you have any other questions, let me open up my, uh, my bio slide one last time here for the day um, just so you can find me again. So if you have any questions, you can, you can find me at, uh, at B-Night at Pragmatic Works. You can also find me at, uh, at uh, my Twitter handle, at Brian Knight. Again, I, I posted the Twitter as a, if you, uh, the, the whole list of public record sets. If you go to twitter.com forward slash Brian Knight, you don't need to have a, a Twitter uh, signed in. You want to see it right there. As a matter of fact, I am going to just post this into your chat window as well. So just in case you have any questions on that, you can find it there as well. And it uh, looks like I tuned in late. Did not see a demo of the essay. Okay, gotcha. Uh, so uh, if you have any other questions, though, uh, please feel free to email me. And it will be on as we recorded also and posted, uh, Liz, in the next few days here. It looks like we're all done with questions, but uh, you guys have a great day. If you have any questions, please feel free to email us. Have a great day.